Um, like the last two speakers, I'm also presenting uh, work from my thesis. The difference is I'm currently in the process of finishing my thesis, and so what you're seeing is actually work that's in progress um, rather than something that's finished. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is modularity, permutation, and open form. Um, these are three ideas that uh, I'll, I'll define here in a few minutes. But first, I want to start with the premise of my thesis. So what I'm looking at is visual identity design and um, type in the service of visual identity. And so um, there is a movement, I guess, afoot in visual identity design to, to think of it more as a flexible system rather than um, sort of the late modernist idea of a repeatable thing that is static and always appears the same in every instance. Um, so in 2008, one of my heroes in design, uh, Hugh Dubberley, wrote an article called Design in the Age of Biology. And he talked about, at a sort of a 30,000 foot view of design, that uh, design is changing uh, as, a, as a discipline from something that is dealing with um, more technology-based um, ideas like information flow and networks of actors rather than um, more traditional ideas of form making. Uh, and so part of that is this comparison of what he calls a mechanical object ethos versus an organic systems ethos, um, which is what he claims that we're moving toward. Um, and so some of the things that I found interesting here were the um, idea of something that's self-organized or grown rather than something that's made. Um, designer as author, or designer as facilitator versus designer as author. Um, and then the idea of client as a, as a steward of the thing that is designed rather than an owner of that thing. Um, and finally, a stopping condition that is good enough for now and that can continue to adapt and evolve rather than something that is almost perfect and complete. Um, these are things that challenge me because I feel like I was educated in the more mechanical object ethos and so trying to break out of that and really try to understand what um, these other ideas mean. And so thinking more specifically about visual identity design, um, there's this notion that designers are going to be creating visual identities that have um, perpetually updatable databases and generative archives rather than um, perhaps a, a, a minimum kit of parts that is turned over to the client. And so um, there are these three ideas that, that I've come across, modularity, permutation, and open form. I see them as sitting on a continuum from something that's less complex to something that's more complex. Uh, and so the, the three prototypes that I'm going to show you today that I've been working on um, run the gamut from modularity to open form. Uh, speaking specifically of modularity, this is the idea that parameters are fixed. Um, there's a low bit of complexity and um, the designer is exerting the most control at this point. Um, and so there's this idea that was first, the term was first coined I think by um, an architect Peter Pierce in the 1970s, uh, minimum inventory, maximum diversity. So this is the idea that you're starting with a, a small number of things and, and you're creating a large number of things from that. And so I think an example that we could relate to is type cooker. Um, this is breaking a typeface down into various parameters and then fixing those parameters. So you hit refresh, you get a new set of parameters, but the idea is that you're designing a typeface based on those parameters. Um, permutation deals with constants and variables. So you're still talking about parameters, but now the parameters are less fixed. They're allowed to the fluctuate a little bit. Um, this is moderately complex, and um, the designer is releasing some of his or her control over the, the final outcome, um, rather than trying to, to control that. So another tool that we might be more familiar with, um, prototypo, is something where you're not necessarily uh, controlling all of the variables. You're allowing interpolation and, and the code that the application um, has controls some of those things. You're simply sliding a slider and allowing it to do what it does. And then finally, the idea of open form uh, deals with data flows. This is 
highly complex and you have very little control. So rather than you controlling those parameters, they're still fluctuating, they're in flux, but you're not necessarily the one inputting the data that controls um, what those variables do. So then in order to create something, I needed um, content. And so what I did was I, I sort of looked for something that was of interest to me. Um, and since a child, I've been in, since I was a child, I've been interested in um, lunar astronomy, astronomy in general. Um, and so I found this fairly obscure process that was uh, named after Meton of Athens. He realized that 235 lunar cycles um, is about the same as 19 solar years. And so by adding a few uh, days of the year in a a, some leap months every so often, you can sort of synchronize the lunar and solar calendars so that you don't sort of have this slipping of the, the seasons through the year if you're simply um, staying with, with the lunar calendar. Um, and so this was fairly influential for a while until the Julian calendar was introduced. And so I used this um, metonic cycle as sort of the, the content of the three prototypes that I created. And so what I'm doing is I'm creating three visual identities for three hypothetical companies or entities uh, and using various aspects of the metonic cycle as the content for each one of those. So the first one I came up with in lunar geology, zircon is one of the most common elements on the moon. Um, and so I sort of combined that with this idea of these things called zomes. I'm not sure if you guys have ever seen these, but they're, they're these structures sort of like geodesic domes that are built out of a, um, a single shape that just sort of fluctuates. It's a diamond that either gets wider or narrower as you get toward the top or the bottom. And so it's sort of the, the tagline I came up with for this company was a moon bases for planet Earth. So it's these sort of unusual dwellings that, um, or structures that can be built. And so I wanted a visual identity and a typeface that represented this that was um, along the same lines. So I started working with these paper models of the, the element zirconium. And I started building these three-dimensional forms out of them um, that took on these sort of interesting shapes. But then what I wanted to do is I wanted to take that and flatten it into two dimensions so that I could then generate a typeface from that. And so what I first came up with was this pattern that represented the way that these models would sort of interlock with one another. Um, and then if you connect the center points of all of those shapes within that, you get a more complex uh, pattern that looks like this. And so kind of similar to what Joe and Ryan presented earlier, this typeface was generated from the shapes found within this pattern. Um, and so I isolated all of the various shapes um, and started to put those things together, rotate them in different ways. And, and I had no idea whether or not I could sort of discover type um, from these shapes. So I started piecing them together and I started seeing these stems um, start to come together, serifs, that were um, forming at the bottoms of these things. And so then ultimately came up with enough material to create this typeface based on the, the matrix that I showed a couple slides prior. So these are some sort of minor variations of that and then sort of a final um, resolved letter mark based on the shapes found in that um, two-dimensional matrix. So then the next prototype um, that I created was for a hypothetical hotel, um, Hotel Meton. And what I wanted to do with this was um, look at sort of the way that the metonic cycle actually works um, and to be sort of influenced by the culture uh, that Meton existed within. And so I started looking at um, images from Greek antiquity and, and objects as well. Um, and also sort of patterns that, that were being used on various things. But I also was interested in the fact that even though visual identity design has been sort of preached as this thing that is static and repeatable, um, there were some modernists who were doing very interesting and flexible things. Um, this is Alexander Girard's identity for La Fonda del Sol. And it didn't have a single logo. It had a, an idea of a logo that you could sort of create these permutations of. Um, so he had about five faces, about five um, different sort of 
sun rays, and then these various colors that you could recombine in, in new and interesting ways. Um, and so sort of combining those two ideas um, with the metonic cycle, there are these leap years in the metonic cycle every so often that add an extra month to the calendar. Um, and so thinking about that in terms of the way that that would look visually, um, you have this 19 year cycle where there are seven uh, long years and 12 short years. Um, and so that sort of rhythm was what guided me to um, create a typeface that's sort of flexible and can get wider and narrower. Um, and so I, I worked in glyphs and I found this sort of simple um, couple lines of code that you could add to the typeface uh, that depending on where it was and what it was next to, the, the letters would either be the normal width or they would stretch um, to indicate the, the sort of lo the longer years of the metonic cycle. And so taking the words hotel meton um, and applying that sort of rhythm of the 19 years, 12 of which are normal, um, seven of which are longer, you sort of get these different permutations of the logo. Um, it's all from the same typeface and so it sort of all looks like it belongs, um, but there's a variation there that happens. And I'm sort of releasing some of the control I have over that. Whatever letters come next, they decide whether they're going to be wide or narrow um, based on the, the sort of algorithm that I've created. And so when you add that to this mark that I made for um, this fictitious hotel, that also has some parameters that vary. Um, the owl's eyes either open or close um, to varying degrees. So here you can see on the wings there's a pattern and, and those patterns are derived from um, the letters and the words Hotel Meton. So there are these various elements that recombine um, at random for a total, a possible um, total permutation. There's 288 possible permutations of this um, logo. And I'll just keep moving. So this last example is the, the most complex. This deals with open form and the idea that um, there are external factors controlling uh, the variables rather than, than a designer. And this is also the one that, that's um, least resolved at this point, so I only have some uh, examples to show. But the fictitious organization here is this sort of um, ancestry or genetic sort of company um, like the, the DNA service that's offered by Ancestry.com or 23andMe. Um, and this idea comes from the fact that a calypic cycle is four metonic cycles plus one day um, because Calypis decided that um, the metonic cycle would still sort of cause problems over long periods of time, so another day needed to be added um, every 76 years. And 76 years happens to also be about the life expectancy of a human being. Um, and so I started thinking about typography as a living thing, um, a thing that, that was born sort of young and immature and grew to something more mature. Um, over time. And so what I wanted to do was use the different parts of this cycle uh, to govern parameters of the typeface. And so the, the lunar rhythm governs the weight of the letter forms. Um, the solar rhythms, which are longer, govern the, um, the width of the letter forms. And then finally the position, which metonic cycle you're in of the four that exist within a um, calypic cycle determine the, the sort of ends of the letter forms. And so here you can see a simple example of um, a waxing and waning sort of thing like um, from a new moon to a full moon and back to a new moon. Uh, but if you'll notice, as this goes from left to right, the letter form is actually increasing in width slightly because it's also moving through um, the, the solar cycle at the same time. So that you get this sort of over a year span of time, you get this letter form that goes from thin and narrow and sort of waxes and wanes, but also gets longer. Um, as you get toward uh, the summer solstice and then would get narrower again as you move back toward the winter solstice. Um, and it's, it's difficult to see because it happens over such a long period of time, but the terminals at the, the bottoms of these letter forms would go from this sort of young looking rounded sans serif typeface to something that's um, more serious looking as it matures uh, over time. And so the terminals would gradually shift um, and so 
over the course of the four metonic cycles, you would get something that goes from, like I said, something that's a sans serif with rounded terminals um, to a more serious looking sans serif uh, to something that, that sort of sprouts these um, slabs sort of at the midlife crisis point of the typeface. Um, and then ultimately those, those serifs are um, connected to the strokes by a bracket um, as it grows more mature over time. Um, and I believe that is all I have. Thank you.